this video we're going to be talking about applied optimization and in this particular problem we've been told that a rectangular sheet of paper with perimeter 39 centimeters is going to be rolled into a cylinder. So obviously the cylinder would have hollow ends. We're just going to take a rectangle like this one and roll it around on itself until it forms a cylinder. What dimensions of the sheet would maximize the volume of the cylinder? So as with any applied optimization problem, the first thing you want to do is clear out all the clutter in the problem. You want to go straight to the word maximize or minimize or maximum or minimum to figure out what we're trying to maximize or minimize because that's the function that we're going to be working with. So if we look in our problem here, what we see is we have maximize the volume, right? We can ignore everything else, it just says maximize the volume. So what that tells us, because we're trying to maximize the volume, we're going to need a function for volume of the cylinder, right? Maximize the volume of the cylinder. We need a function for the volume of the cylinder. That's the function we're going to be working with. So what do we know about the volume of a cylinder? Well, the volume of a cylinder is given by the formula volume is equal to pi r squared h. So this is the formula we're going to start with. But whatever function we're going to be working with, in this case the volume function, we're going to need to get it in terms of one variable only. Right now we have a variable r for the radius and a variable h for the height. So somehow we need to get it from two variables to one variable. Well, what other information have we been given? We've been told we have this rectangular sheet of paper with perimeter 39 centimeters. So first of all, let's go ahead and call the dimensions of this rectangle x and y. We'll say that the dimensions of the rectangle are x by y. We know that the perimeter is 39 centimeters. Well, if I go ahead and say this is also y and this is also x because we're dealing with a rectangle, the perimeter is 39 centimeters. Well, I can say that the perimeter is 2x plus 2y, right? I can add up x plus y plus x plus y to get the perimeter of this rectangle and I would get 2x plus 2y. So that's going to be my perimeter, but I know my perimeter is equal to 39 centimeters, so I can say 39 is equal to 2x plus 2y. I also know that if I roll this sheet into a cylinder, right, if I take this edge here, y, and I start folding it over this way until it meets this edge, y, then I'm going to have this vertical cylinder, which means that this value here, y, is going to be the height of the cylinder. So this is height is equal to y. h is going to be equal to y because this is the height of my cylinder. I also know that this distance x, that's going to be what I roll around on itself. x is going to end up being the circumference of the cylinder because if you imagine rolling the sheet of paper over onto itself, this distance x is going to be the distance all the way around the cylinder. So what I can say is I can imagine that this distance here, x, is basically the circumference of my cylinder, the circumference of the circle here, so that's going to be x. Well, I know that the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, so I can go ahead and say that x is going to be equal to 2 pi r. And now I'm starting to see that I'm going to be able to get my volume formula in terms of x only. Here's how. We know that h is equal to y, right? The height is equal to y. So I could say that my perimeter equation, I could make the substitution h equals y and say, 39 is equal to 2x plus, instead of 2y, call it 2h. Now I could solve this for h. I'll subtract 2x from both sides and get 39 minus 2x is equal to 2h. Dividing both sides by 2 to get h by itself, I'll end up with h is equal to 39 minus 2x all over 2. Now I have this value for h in terms of x that I can go ahead and plug in here for h. I also want to get r in terms of x though so that I could plug in for r. But I have this equation that relates x and r so I just need to solve it for r which I can do by dividing both sides by 2 pi. So dividing both sides by 2 pi I end up with r is equal to x over 2 pi. Now in our volume equation we can make some substitutions and we can say volume is equal to pi times r squared. Well we know that r is x over 2 pi so we'll get x over 2 pi quantity squared multiplied by h. Well we know h is 39 minus 2x all over 2. And now you can see that we have our entire volume equation in terms of one variable only, just x. Remember that pi is a constant, it's not a variable, so the only variable in this equation is x. Now we just need to simplify this equation to the point where we're able to take the derivative of it. So we'll say volume is equal to pi squaring x over 2 pi. We're going to get 
x squared over 2 pi squared is going to be 4 pi squared. Multiply by, we'll separate our fraction here and get 39 over 2 minus 2x over 2. The 2's will cancel and we just get minus x. We're going to get this pi in the numerator to cancel with one of the pi's in the denominator, leaving us with volume equals x squared over 4 pi multiplied by 39 over 2 minus x. We want to go ahead and distribute the x squared over 4 pi, so we get volume is equal to 39 x squared over 8 pi minus x cubed over 4 pi when we distribute that value. So now we've got the volume equation we need. Remember we were told maximize the volume, so we know we needed a volume equation. We've got the volume equation, we've got it in terms of one variable only, and it's simplified to the point where we can find the derivative. That's always going to be our next step is to find the derivative. So we'll call the derivative v prime, and that's going to be equal to, and these are just power functions. So to find the derivative, we'll multiply by this exponent. We'll bring the exponent down in front. So we're going to get 2 times 39. We have 8 in the denominator. We'll get 2 to cancel, and the 8 will just become 4. So we'll be left with 39x over 4 pi. The derivative of negative x cubed over 4 pi will bring the exponent out in front, and we'll be left with minus 3x squared over 4 pi. Once we have the derivative function, our next step is always to find critical points of the function, which we do by setting the derivative equal to 0. So we'll go ahead and set this equal to 0, and we want to solve for our variable. We'll multiply through everything by 4 pi, because that'll get rid of our fractions here, get rid of our denominators, and 0 times 4 pi is still just 0. So that's going to leave us with 39x minus 3x squared equals 0. Dividing through everything by 3, we get 13x minus x squared equals 0. When we factor, we get x times 13 minus x equals 0. And then using 0 theorem, we can say x equals 0 or x equals 13. But of course, x equals 0 is not a possible solution because if we go look at what x actually represents, x is the width here of our rectangular sheet of paper. And if x were equal to 0, the paper wouldn't exist, right? Because the width would be 0, so that's not possible. So x equals 0 is not a solution, which means x equals 13 is the value that we want to test. So x equals 13 is the potential critical point of the function. Remember that critical point is a point where the function changes direction from decreasing to increasing or from increasing to decreasing. Because we've just found this one critical point, this is probably the point that maximizes the volume of the cylinder, but we need to prove it. In order to prove that x equals 13 is the value that maximizes the volume of the cylinder, we're going to use what's called the first derivative test. And as you might guess, the first derivative test uses the first derivative, which is this value v prime that we found. So here's how we use the first derivative. We create a simple number line like this, and we go ahead and plot the potential critical point that we found right in the middle. So x equals 13, we'll just put that right in the middle, and then we want to pick values that are close to this potential critical point on either side of it in order to test those in the first derivative. So we'll pick x equals 12 and x equals 14. And what we're going to do is test both of those values in our first derivative. I like to label my number line with the first derivative, v prime, so that I remember which function I'm plugging into. So what I'm going to do then is say v prime of 12 is going to be equal to 39 times 12. I'm plugging into this function here, v prime. So 39 times 12 divided by 4 pi minus 3 times 12 squared divided by 4 pi. And what's important is not the exact value here, but whether or not this value you get is positive or negative. And if we do the arithmetic here, what we see is that we get a positive value. What about v prime of 14? We have to test the other side here. v prime of 14 is going to be equal to, we just do 39 times 14 divided by 4 pi minus 3 times 14 squared divided by 4 pi. And again, the exact value isn't important, just whether or not we get a positive or negative value. If we do this arithmetic, we see that we get a negative value. 
So what do we do with this positive and negative value here? Well, the fact that x equals 13 returned a positive value in the derivative, we can say a positive value over here. The fact that x equals 14 returned a negative value, we can say negative value over here. So the derivative is positive when x equals 12, which means the derivative is positive to the left of x equals 13. When the derivative is positive, the original function is increasing. So I like to draw an increasing line. When the derivative is negative, the function is decreasing, so we can draw a decreasing line like this, and then I'll just make these arrows. So what then you see is the original function is increasing to the left of x equals 13 and decreasing to the right of x equals 13. So by the first derivative test, we've shown literally and proven that x equals 13 represents a maximum of the function because the function is coming up and then at x equals 13 it switches direction and it starts going down, which means that x equals 13 has to be the highest point in this region. It has to be a maximum of the function. So because we tested v prime, the derivative of the volume function, we can say x equals 13 represents the point at which the volume is maximized. And our final step then is just to go back to the original question and make sure we answer the specific question we were asked because the answer is not always just going to be x equals 13 as a maximum. So what were we actually asked? What dimensions of the sheet would maximize the volume? So what dimensions? We have to give the dimensions of the rectangular sheet of paper. So the dimensions are x times y, x by y. So we have to give dimensions there. Well, we already know x is 13, but we also have to give y. So we'll go ahead and say that the dimensions are x by y, or 13 by whatever y is. Well, remember y is equal to h, right? We said h is equal to y down here. We have an equation for h, so we can go ahead and say instead of h equals, we can say y equals. We can plug in the value we found for x and get a value for y. So y is going to be equal to 39 minus 2 times x is 13, so we plug in 13 divided by 2. So y is equal to 39 minus 26 all over 2. 39 minus 26 is 13, so we get y is equal to 13 over 2, 13 halves, which would be 6 and a half. So we can leave it as 13 halves. Let's go ahead and say 6 and a half. So the dimensions of the rectangular sheet of paper have to be 13 by 6 and a half in order to maximize the volume of the cylinder, assuming that the perimeter of the rectangle is 39 centimeters.